Thank you for attending this session on slice bread and libraries, putting the federated identity pieces together. For many of you, you've been following the story of federated identity for the last 20 years, and slowly but surely, the pieces are coming together to deliver the type of integrated user-friendly service that we'd like to have. This session will cover that. In particular, um, we're going to look at some of the problems that are out there today. Um, the issues with um, proxies, um, some missed opportunities for privacy preserving personalization, and finally the increasing um, sets of requirements that privacy regulations are putting on um, access. We'll put the pieces together now. We're going to talk about IDP identity provided discovery via seamless access. Um, we'll briefly touch on the federated identity space. Um, we'll talk about some normative bundles of attributes, um, which is a way to scale um, access control and preserve privacy at the same time. Um, and how we might achieve that, and finally, how users can be involved in the experience and provide consent and control over what information is being passed. There's still a few um, small pieces missing, and we'll mention those, um, including the selective release of values from a multi-valued attribute. The uh, unfortunate exemplar for that is um, group memberships. Um, they're um, all of your group memberships are contained in a single attribute um, that is multi-valued and we only want to pass selected group memberships to aligned parties depending upon the aligned party. Um, there's a similar uh, set of uh, needs that need to be addressed around signaling what attributes various parts of a um, ent entity might need um, again, with the intention of preserving privacy. Um, some community standards on um, how we choose the perimeter between what are required and optional attributes. And finally, reporting utilities that would allow um, management of um, access control and content. Um, the problems to solve, again, um, we know about the proxy issues and the theft of content. That was certainly a prime motivator in the move away from IP-based access control and proxies towards something more secure that also can be privacy-preserving. Um, the lack of privacy-preserving personalization, we'll touch on that in a second, as well as the regulations. There are several ways in which um, um, we can personalize experiences um, and still preserve privacy and um, we now have the technologies to do that and we're looking for um, opportunities to use those technologies. Certainly accessibility, the ability to <coughs> customize a screen for um, uh, uh, blindness, for color sensitivities, for um, cognitive um, uh, issues, uh, all of those things can be managed using privacy preserving approaches. Um, there are many use cases around having a, a, a gated community where only certain um, members of, of the general public can get in, but once you're in, you're privacy preserved, as if you were uh, wearing a mask in the old definition of um, masks over the eyes. Um, and finally, um, there are many places where um, role-playing games, etc., where using vetted avatars um, to <coughs> um, preserve privacy but offer continuity of the user. Um, and then those can allow um, other kinds of identity vetting, um, such as reputation systems, opportunities. Finally, privacy regulations. There's a number of them that um, have been on the radar now for several years. Uh, GDPR um, is the most notable one. It covers um, 
uh, Europe and by um, um, some extension the rest of the world who in interacts with Europeans. Um, uh, it was passed several years ago. Um, it took a couple of years for adoption. Um, it's in the last year that um, real fines are being leveled. Um, and most uh, interestingly for this talk, um, in May of 2020, the European Court of Justice um, tightened release and purpose of use issues. And you can see that in the revised cookie structures that are now out there on um, most uh, marketing um, and business sites um, with different kinds of cookies and different fine grain cookie control. That's an outcome of that uh, ruling by the EU Court of Justice. Um, issues that are central in, in, in this uh, uh, ongoing privacy space is the basis for release. Why is the information being released by the identity provider? And for what purpose will the relying party use that, uh, um, those attributes? And again, the cookie um, paradigm that you see now with, I believe, three or four <laughs> categories of use um, is an example of that. I won't touch on the California um, Consumer Privacy Act and other state-based initiatives other than to say that they're out there, um, they're uh, inconsistent, and um, it's just not clear yet um, what consequence they have for our, our, our communities. Um, one act that is very interesting that you might want to follow both as a consumer of health care and perhaps a librarian of um, uh, electronic health information is a um, in very large piece of legislation that was passed uh, in 2016, the Cures Act. Um, it's guided by the Office of the National Coordinator in HHS, and um, you will see major impacts both on your use of medical services personally um, and on um, issues that institutions that manage electronic health information will need to pay attention to. And there are certainly pockets of those in our universities. Um, I do want to close uh, the, uh, the survey of, of drivers with a mention of the Canadian Digital Identity Initiative. Uh, in my eyes, it's the gold standard. Um, it has a trust framework that is built um, on a very uh, simple and useful model. Um, terms are defined. Um, assessment capabilities are specified against the trust framework. The trust framework itself consists of um, six um, layers, um, and um, um, I, I appreciate that notice and consent have been pulled out as their own particular layer in a trust framework. Um, in regards to that, that same for trust framework um, specifies with some degree of um, rigor what um, uh, when consent and notice um, need to be um, used. Um, it's a very um, useful set of guidelines. Uh, notice that it's opt-in. It can be for transactions or for extended periods of time. Um, explicit in language. And if you're a consent geek like I am, you might um, uh, follow that PDF. It's interesting reading. So. Federated identity, some important pieces have slid in. It's now a, um, um, a somewhat complete user experience. Um, there's a identity provided discovery that is consistent among sites via the seamless access work. There's federated identity itself. There's the emergence of some normative bundles of attributes that are of particular interest in the library space. And now they were finally the beginnings of um, deployment of user control attribute release capabilities. Um, we'll cover each of those briefly, and then we'll do a demo of how they fit together in something called slice bread. 
Uh, identity provided discovery, uh, seamless access has emerged as a paradigm um, and community standard. Um, it was developed uh, con by content providers, identity operators, standards groups. It was a nice process. Um, there's a standard icon that users can know to click on to, to discover their identity provider. And there are several valuable integration choices that a relying party and a user can, can um, opt for that um, 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 can make the, um, this experience of finding your identity provider uh, very efficient. Um, seamlessaccess.org is the um, uh, site for more information. Federated identity, 20 years in now, it's the default model for uh, internet identity. It emerged from r &E many years ago. Um, there are other forms of identity out there. Um, centralized identity still percolates. The self-sovereign uh, identity crowd muddle along as well, um, but um, um, they just haven't gotten um, the um, traction across so many different verticals as has uh, federated identity. Um, it comes in two flavors, uh, SAML, which we uh, um, was raised in this environment, and OpenID Connect, um, some of the technologies that are used both in the social space and increasingly uh, on campus as a um, another way to um, manage um, identity flows and attribute flows. Um, the idea of federation can either be bilateral or multilateral. Um, this was all designed to be multilateral, such as in common and uh, educating for international uh, R&E um, activities, um, but uh, bilateral is a lot easier for cloud service providers to handle. And so um, there is a dynamic about the um, usefulness of, of implementations by cloud service providers um, of federated uh, um, services. The original focus of this work was interdomain exchange of attributes. Authentication was just part of the agenda, but it became the mechanism for federated single sign-on early on, and that was a very useful and important business. And so we got a very tight focus on all of the complexities and issues for um, uh, federated single sign-on. We had to evolve levels of assurance, incident handling mechanisms, a dynamic metadata for the size of the uh, federations that were growing, and now I think the community is beginning to address the exchange of attributes um, um, now, sort of. Um, speaking of the exchange of attributes, there are now normative bundles. Um, they're used together for common use cases. Um, how might they be used? Um, well, the IDP might decide that it's going to implement a bundled release and release the set of attributes if a site the relying party is so tagged. Um, it can handle um, requests from the SPs for attributes, and it can also be used, these normative attributes to um, bundles to configure end user consent mechanisms such as CAR. Um, the need to accommodate a variety of existing campus policies has made uh, some of these attribute bundles um, uh, more complicated than they need to be because um, if all universities never reassigned email addresses, it would be that unique perfect identifier, but that's not a policy at all universities. Um, similarly, there's uh, variations in how one defines affiliations, um, and some, sometimes these attribute bundles wind up being either this, if your policy is that, or do this release of attributes if your policies are these. Um, adds complexity to the system. The primary existing example out there are very widespread, uh, but not widespread enough is research and scholarship, RNS. Um, it's intended for federated login use for the research community. Um, it consists of a shared user identifier. Um, 
a personal name, an email address, and an optional affiliation. So you can see it's identity rich. For the access control space, it's a different story. Overall, as a community, we've evolved from identity-based access control mechanisms with lists of names in an access control um, uh, file associated with some data um, to role-based, where those list of names might be replaced by a list of roles. But those were too coarse-grained, so we went attribute-based. And finally, we're starting to think about policy-based, where we don't get rid of the attribute base, but there's enough work there that we need to create institutional level policies and user-based policies that can manage the collection of attributes. That's where we're headed. Um, one of the most important um, access control attributes are, is affiliation. Um, we use it um, a lot in the library community, in the content uh, uh, commun communities. It has course semantics. As you can see, those are the values it can have. Um, and so we're looking increasingly at another attribute, edu-person entitlements, that can have a variety of values. And we're beginning to see um, thoughts in that space. And it's very fertile ground should point out that an entitlement may not exist actually in the enterprise directory. It may be a computed value for transfer to the relying party by the IDP as part of the on the wire uh, communication. And finally, as a member of group memberships are very handy. That's how we manage a lot of attributes on the campus side. Um, um, it's just a matter of figuring out how to make it a better vehicle for inter institutional use. Um, three new bundles are now in the uh, uh, library space uh, that are of interest. Um, they've been proposed and are available for comment. Um, they cover the use cases for authentication only, anonymous authorization, and pseudonymous authorization, which allows some uh, personalization and state. The standards process for this is community-based. We began in a working group. Um, convened by seamless access. Um, this, the proposal was passed to the REFEDS, the International r &E Federation Schema Group, for um, uh, consideration and comment and adoption. And now um, we're um, at that stage where hopefully federations and IEPs will begin to adopt it. And it's also being reflected in the contract language working group, which is out there as an activity. Um, and metrics and usage statistic attributes, I, I raised that as a question. Turns out there's some work going on right now. Um, this, the next piece in the puzzle is consent informed attribute release. Uh, we call it CAR. It's a piece of uh, software that's been developed by Internet2 and Duke University um, from an, uh, a grant several years ago from uh, uh, NIST. Um, it provides uh, end user management for uh, consent, um, both inline during a transaction and self service, uh, 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 the ability to manage your stored consents. Um, it has effective enterprise and end user management. It has unexpected compliance benefits. It's open source. And it's going back, in, in my mind, to the original purpose of what we built this infrastructure for. Um, the at original uh, SHIB t-shirt said, uh, we'll work for attributes, this works for attributes. Um, this is what the screens of CAR looks like. Everything is customizable. The name of the identity provider is Amber in this case. Um, um, you'll see that um, there's clear guidance on whether you're permitting the release or denying the release, uh, a use of standard colors and, and symbols. Uh, the values being released are displayed. The purpose of use is being released, uh, is being displayed. And then you have the ability to suppress the, um, the consent screen and just store that as your persistent consent until you choose to change it um, or not. Um, it, uh, po privacy policies for the site you are going to are also listed. We'll see this as part of the demo. Um, here's uh, another uh, faculty example. Um, again, um, 
releasing lots of information about access control and nothing about identity. So that's a very privacy-preserving option. I mean, and this is what the self-serve console looks like. Again, we'll see it dynamically in just a minute. The ability to manage your consent policies based upon the relying party you've owned. There are APIs. Um, notice there's a couple of roles here. There's the user um, in a transaction. There's the user doing the self-serve. There's somebody who manages policy, and then there's a major admin. Uh, this is an interesting branch that we could explore um, in a longer talk about gathering the informed content that you just saw in those screens that helps the user to make quality decisions. Um, a car has the ability to consume the uh, new attribute bundles um, in several different ways, including um, the release of um, without consent by the IDP, configuring a, um, a, a hint to users but requiring consent, um, or just using it in notice and transparency mechanisms. Um, there's lots of uh, things we can do. Uh, so we're going to put these all together in a slice bread demo. I'm going to leave the PowerPoint behind and um, um, go to uh, show you uh, using seamless access and federated authentication a variety of users, an undergraduate uh, student and a faculty member accessing different sites and finally a brief window into what the, uh, uh, the admin interface looks like. Exit this and go to the uh, interactive demo. So first I'm going to go to the a research and scholarship site. That was a tag I mentioned. And this is, in fact, Seamless Access presenting itself. A list of identity providers. Um, in this demo, we only have one. This could be a managed list. Um, here's the a useful icon. Uh, here's uh, what I was trying to access. Um, Seamless Access does a good job of keeping that continuity of user experience. I'm going to log on. I'm going to log on as an undergraduate with a password. This is the federated identity and authentication. And then I get to the consent screen um, uh, that CAR presents as part of the shibboleth experience in this case. The values that are being released and their consequence, this is a dynamic. Um, I've picked something that is identity rich, um, though I've concealed some information. I can suppress the experience. I can look at the privacy policy. I'm going to just save and continue. And you'll see that the relying party will acknowledge that this is the information it received, display name, etc. In fact, that display name is right up here to give me a customized experience, and also um, that I didn't release my affiliation. I'm going to sign out. I'm going to go back and I'm going to go as a faculty member to a commercial content site. Again, I see um, content OS is where I'm going. Seamless access as the user experience for identity discovery. I'm now going to log on as a faculty member. After the password. And you can see that the information now being released to Content R Us um, has some interesting information. Um, I've concealed identity, but I've said I'm in the School of Law, so I can get to uh, departmentally licensed content. And then I have some group memberships, and because they're sensitive according to at least GDPR contexts, I can obfuscate them and display them and choose whether to release them or not. Um, if I just release this information, I'll be able to preserve privacy but still get to um, some content which is licensed for the School of Law where I'm located. You can see I can get to LexisNexis, and here's the information that's been released. Some groups that I'm a member of, um, my identity provider, my uh, law school access, but nothing that identifies me. You can see no display. I'm going to sign out. 
I'm going to go now back to um, the um, self-serve uh, console and show you um, what uh, um, let me make sure that was the right sequence I have to do. Faculty self serve console. Yes, okay, thank you. Bear with me. Back to the recording in group. Um, so, um, the last uh, demo that we'll do is uh, looking at the self service uh, interface. Uh, okay, Safari. I'm going to uh, log in as a faculty member and um, I have to release attributes to the self-service screen. That was that flicker. And now I'm in here and I can see my console of uh, um, release policies. I can manage what's being released. So if I want to change what the, um, whether uh, my permit or deny, I can edit that information, um, etc. However, I'm not, I just wanted to show you that uh, self-serve console. Last part of the demo is to come in to the interface, the admin interface. I'm now going to log in. You just saw uh, uh, seamless access for the last time in this demo. Um, and um, I can configure relying parties with different tags so that adding one of the new attribute bundles consists of um, creating a new policy if I wanted to um, and um, I can create the policies for um, institution or for users. The policies can include what might get released and when and under what considerations. Um, um, there's uh, extensive uh, admin capabilities. Some of those can be delegated out to individuals, for example, technical librarians to manage the attribute bundle themselves. Let's get back to the PowerPoint to talk briefly about what's missing, and thank you for attending. What's missing? Well, as I alluded to, um, you saw that group memberships had a pretty clunky interface in CAR about um, um, what attributes to release. If there were many different group memberships, that interface would have been really ugly. Um, and that's the best one I've seen. So we need to change that. Um, we need some good purposes of use um, um, so that users can know um, when attributes are being released in our community, what they're for. Something, a taxonomy, not dissimilar in nature, perhaps, to what's happening in the advertising industry. We need fine-grained signaling so that various parts of the wiki can say, this, this part of the wiki is only open to these group memberships. Um, only send these attributes if you're, these group memberships, if you're coming to this part of the wiki. Um, uh, there's community standards that would say, when is something really required? When is it really necessary? Rethinking uh, applications. This is kind of reflecting some of the privacy by design. Um, there's some reporting utilities that we want to see, and there's some interesting work just starting up now, a consultation on some analytics um, that would allow uh, uh, the library community to do some um, privacy-preserving reporting of usage. Follow fim for l um, it's a group of librarians. Um, contact your campus uh, IDM people so that you understand what the environment is, what capabilities they have for new attribute bundles, for user consent, etc. cetera, um, um, how they think about entitlements. And then finally, we're going to be working with the publishers and community groups for um, making these new kinds of uh, attribute bundle capabilities uh, reflect in purpose of use, um, in contract language, and uh, I would imagine these act standard activities uh, 
will continue. Uh, finally, um, well, I'll put this slide up for um, contact information. And I thank you for listening to this presentation.